For Spalding's classifications, high-level disinfection is an acceptable reprocessing modality of semi-critical endoscopes. Published articles and discussion have surfaced raising the topic for the consideration of a paradigm shift from high-level disinfection to sterilization of endoscopes to improve patient safety. But Justin, everybody has to remember that cleaning is the first step to achieving high-level disinfection and sterilization. So we also have to look at the cleaning practices as well. From the basement to the boardroom, from ideas to innovation, you are listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Each week, you will encounter diverse perspectives from subject matter experts across the country and around the globe. Frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you are turning in for education or inspiration, we are glad you are here. Now, turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. On this vendor spotlight, we have a panel of guests from Advanced Sterilization Products, or ASP, to discuss recent evidence indicating the potential hidden points of failure in endoscope reprocessing. Nancy Fellows, Senior Clinical Education Consultant, Dr. Ryan Lewis, Senior Director of Medical Affairs and Medical Safety, and Jeremy Yarwood, VP of Research and Development, will join us to explain why an institutional shift from high-level disinfection, or HLD, to sterilization of flexibility flexible endoscopes to improve patient safety is deserving of consideration. Nancy's career spans many years beginning as a perioperative registered nurse at University Hospitals of Cleveland and the operating room operations manager at the renowned Cleveland Clinic. She has over 20 years of experience as a clinical education consultant and key opinion leader for advanced sterilization products, providing knowledge, consultation, and education to healthcare facilities and departments aligned with ASP's products. She has had the honor to present domestically and abroad, is published, and is serving her second term as a member of the Ohio Board of Nursing, which is a governor appointment. Dr. Ryan Lewis is a licensed physician with over 20 years of experience in the medical device industry. He earned his medical degree from Drexel University School of Medicine and received residency training in surgery and otolaryngology before entering the medical device field. Dr. Lewis has a Master of Public Health from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health with a focus on global public health leadership, epidemiology, and communicable diseases. Dr. Lewis is accomplished at wheel thrown pottery and enjoys mountain biking and fishing. And finally, Jeremy Yarwood is an innovative global leader of over 100 industry leading R&D professionals in research, commercialization, and validation of novel, connected electromechanical systems and chemical and biological diagnostic technologies for medical devices reprocessing and infection prevention. Prior to joining ASP, Jeremy held numerous positions within 3M, most recently as the Technical General Manager for the 3M China Healthcare Organization. While living in Shanghai, he helped develop products for infection prevention, skin and wound care, food safety, and dental materials. He started his career in the 3M Corporate Research Laboratories as a senior microbiologist. So we have an excellent panel for you today, and we're going to be right back after a short break. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is a panel of guests from Advanced Sterilization Products, most commonly referred to as ASP, and I imagine most of you listeners out there are quite familiar with the Sterad. So I'd like to welcome Nancy Fellows, Senior Clinical Education Consultant, Dr. Ryan Lewis, Senior Director of Medical Affairs and Medical Safety, and Dr. Jeremy Yarwood, VP of Research and Development. Jeremy, we're going to start with you, so welcome to the show. I know it's your first appearance, but you've got a colleague here. Here, Dr. Ryan Lewis, who has joined us in the past. Really happy to have you today. Thanks, Justin. Happy to be here. So, Jeremy, why don't you give us just an introduction to ASP? And as I mentioned, I know a large majority, if not every single listener to be on clean, is familiar with your company. But can you just talk a little bit about what you do and your track record in the industry? 
Yeah, so for more than 30 years, ASP has been a thought leader in the device reprocessing space. We actually started as the company to first deploy a widely used low temperature sterilization technology based on hydrogen peroxide. Of course, you know that today is Sterad. And since that time, we've also made additional investments in device reprocessing, including the automated endoscope reprocessors that we're talking about today, technologies for other areas of high-level disinfection, cleaning, infection control. So we've been a thought leader in this space for a long time and want to continue to be known as a thought leader in this space, particularly when we think about the standard of care for flexible GI scopes today, and we know that there's gaps in how that's practiced, and we know that we can bring solutions and technologies that will really close that gap and provide a much higher margin of safety for our partners and our clinicians in the field today. Well, I definitely understand the innovation piece because that was a big reason that Dr. Ryan Lewis joined us back in April in the early days, I'd say, of the pandemic for a lot of the efforts that ASP had put out there to really help the industry. And I'm going to go to Nancy Fellows now. Nancy, I want to welcome you to this episode as well. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Justin. I'm really excited to be able to join this podcast today. So whenever there's innovation, it's because there's some sort of a problem or some issue or some industry challenge that needs to be solved. So Nancy, I'd like you to talk about that state of the market. What is the biggest industry challenge that you see today? Well, Justin, one of the biggest industry challenges I see today is with endoscope reprocessing. And these challenges aren't really new. In fact, much research and published articles have been addressed about these challenges. In fact, Corey Ofsted's article, Challenges in Achieving High-Level Disinfection and Endoscope Reprocessing, that was published in the American Journal of Infection Control last year, states that there is evidence that exists that endoscope reprocessing may frequently be error-prone, ineffective, and potentially represent danger of contamination exposure to patients. So any which way you look at it, when challenges are not a Dressed, patients are at risk. Yeah, and that's the biggest concern. And I'm 100% with you on that. And I can tell you that we have had several interviews on Beyond Clean where we've talked about this, the complex medical devices, the instructions for use. And then you mentioned this article from Corey Ofsted and talking about some of those improper practices. So can you give us some examples from that article that really stuck out to you? Well, absolutely. And there are many. But what I'd like to start with is human factor. Human factors contribute to non-adherence to guidelines, standards, policies and procedures, and manufacture written instructions for use or IFUs. AORN, the Association for Perioperative Registered Nurses, states, patients have a right to undergo endoscope procedures in a safe, clean environment where personnel adhere to consistent evidence-based practices for processing every flexible endoscope every time care is provided. And additionally, the CDC states that all personnel involved in reprocessing of endoscopes, and this includes supervisors and managers as well of reprocessing personnel, receive ongoing education, training, and assessment of competency. But the second one I'd like to touch base on is really important, and this is the improper use of high-level disinfection practices. Corey Ofsted's team during the study noted staff members using expired products, not monitoring the proper HLD temperature temperature, inadequate testing for the minimum effective concentration or MEC of the high-level disinfected solutions, and improper storage of MEC test strips. And Justin, I'll share with you most sincerely that I didn't really have to read Corey's article to see failures in practice myself. Time and again, I have brought failure of practice to the attention of managers and staff members citing IFUs, standards and guidelines from reputable organizations such as AMI, SGNA, AORN, Isham, CDC, and others. But I digress because for Spalding's classifications, high-level disinfection is an acceptable reprocessing modality of semi-critical endoscopes. Published articles and discussion have surfaced raising the topic for the consideration of a paradigm shift from high-level disinfection to sterilization of endoscopes to improve patient safety. But Justin, everybody has to remember that cleaning is the first step to achieving high-level disinfection and sterilization. So we also have to look at the cleaning practices as well. Those challenges were front and center in healthcare prior to the pandemic. Obviously, that's gotten a great deal of the entire country's focus. But 
Talking about CRE and other uh, commonly referred to as superbug infections really did highlight that issue. Like you said, it, it has to be clean before it can be high level disinfected. And I think every sterile processing technician has had, if it's not clean, it can't be sterile wired into their brains very soon as they enter this industry. But the instructions for use is a really interesting area, I think, in terms of we're seeing a lot more effort into standardization, but that whole competency piece, what a challenge that is. And I think one of the things that you brought out is a lot of times managers and and the educators who may be doing the competencies in the departments are very much focused on the competency for the actual device. But what you're talking about is the actual process to do high-level disinfection and that the instructions for use for that equipment may not be followed. And you highlighted some areas with expired products and improper temperature that may not always be getting the most direct focus. Is that a correct assumption based on what you've seen? Yes, it is. And I would say for years, ASP has sought to introduce innovative technology that protects patients at their most critical moments. You mentioned the Sterat when we started the podcast today, ASP's Sterad NX and Sterad 100 NX sterilization systems have technology capable of penetrating long and narrow lumens, yet gentle enough to reprocess delicate and heat-sensitive instruments such as flexible endoscopes. And I'd like to just mention, too, in my experience as a clinical educator for ASP, I've begun to see that urology departments, whether it's in a doctor's office or a clinic or in the hospital, have begun to change their practice from HLD of their cystoscopes and ureteroscopes, where HLD is an acceptable process per Spalding's classifications to sterilization. Hence, this is elevating their practice. Where ASP also offers a technology that protects patients is we validated sterilization of specific endoscopes. Where validated sterilization of specific endoscopes is not yet available, the ASP AER or Aeroflex automatic endoscope reprocessor and the Evotech ECR endoscope cleaner and reprocessor have features that specifically address multiple points of failure during high-level disinfection reprocessing that were detailed in Corey Ofsted's study. By going to automation, it eliminates using expired products such as solutions and test strips. It eliminates the need for manually monitoring the proper temperature for high-level disinfection for it to be achieved. It eliminates the need for manual testing the solution, the MEC, by automating this task or function. And because it automates the MEC monitoring, this eliminates the need to properly store test strips. Everyone should take the time to review Corey Ofsted's article, Challenges in Achieving Effective High-Level Disinfection and Endoscope Reprocessing. Education is so important. Education and the opportunity to embrace technology that is at our fingertips today can begin to decrease and eventually eliminate errors and challenges associated with failures when reprocessing endoscopes tomorrow. Safety is so important. Safety is paramount. Safety for the employee and safety for our patients that depend on us not to place them in risk of infection. In an area that we have talked about a lot has been around damage to the equipment because there's the instructions for use and there's reprocessing correctly and doing the competencies. But then there's some things that are outside of the reprocessing technician's control. And that's how the instrument's used during the procedure, but very much in their control from the standpoint of doing inspection. But I will also say that there are lots of areas that are not visible to the reprocessing technician when they're inspecting. We don't all see everybody has some sort of a boroscope to be able to go into the lumens and be able to see those areas. But one thing that was also noted in Ofsted's study was that this visible damage could interfere with reprocessing. And so I kind of want to take the conversation over to Dr. Lewis. And so Dr. Lewis, welcome back to the show. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you. It's great to be here. So from your infection control perspective, this risk of infection resulting from these concerns that are causing an alarm, can you go into that and and maybe even what you're hearing in the industry and the buzz? Because again, it felt like it was very much front and center prior to the pandemic. And I know that, that the pandemic has been, you know, actually an area that you've been focused on as well. And obviously it is taking center stage, but this area was very concerning to the medical community. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think as clinical operations begin again in endoscopy suites across the country and across the world, you're going to see that concern resurface. You know, it, as you probably know, the pandemic disrupted a lot of the clinical operations and elective procedures, elective endoscopies were essentially canceled for many months. And so as these units start to begin treating patients again and, and doing routine endoscopies, I think you're going to see that concern resurface. Now, the risk to patients is real. The probability may be fairly low, but the risk is real related to endoscope transmitted disease. And what we're really talking about here is the probability of a patient who's undergoing a procedure receiving a pathogen that's transmitted through the scope into their body that they didn't anticipate getting when they came in to have that procedure done. That's something that we should all be concerned about. And we should try to decrease that probability as low as possible. Think about yourself or a loved one undergoing a procedure. You wouldn't want to have a scope that was questionable as far as its cleanliness and disinfection. So it's an issue. And I think it just dropped off a little bit because we've been focusing on other things related to COVID and the pandemic. So COVID is a coronavirus, but it's not the only coronavirus. Is there information out there that ties different coronaviruses together and can give us some insight on what the risk might look like relative to that type of virus and endoscopes? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. You know, there are a couple of other infamous, I guess, coronaviruses in that family. There's SARS and MERS, both of which have caused pandemics in the past, not to the extent that COVID has. The actual name for the virus that causes COVID is the SARS-CoV-2, as you probably are familiar. But the SARS virus that erupted in 2003 was really one of those opportunities for scientists to learn more about coronavirus outbreaks. And from that time, We've learned quite a few things about the virus relative to its transmission. For example, back in 2003, when we had that SARS outbreak starting in Asia, there were a number of cases that were suspected to be transmitted by patients' feces or urine. In fact, there was a housing complex in Hong Kong where over 300 people became infected there. And it was mysterious because they, as they were doing their contact tracing, they couldn't tell exactly how those folks had become infected as they looked into the plumbing in that facility, they found that there was a defect in the plumbing that had been aerosolizing fecal material into the living spaces, and they were able to trace the virus. Well, that was something that they weren't sure could be an attribute of SARS-CoV-2, or what we know as COVID right now. But recently, a couple of researchers in China have shown that indeed, through feces and through urine, that virus can infect cells. And so and by that virus, I mean the coronavirus that we're dealing with today. And so patients are undergoing procedures where they're having scopes come in contact with their GI contents. They're having scopes placed in their urinary tract. And so it is something to be concerned about for scope cleanliness as we move forward. And, and something that we did learn from previous viruses in the coronavirus family that is now showing to be true in this particular pandemic. Well, at this stage of the game, that's really what we have to rely on is what can we learn from other viruses that are similar? And then how do we adjust and then validate that some things that we know about one type of virus is applicable to another? It's really interesting. And Jeremy, I want to go back to you regarding high level disinfection as we follow on what Dr. Lewis just said. But I've seen a big movement in the industry to move from high level disinfection towards sterilization. Sterilization. Can you give us some background on the reason for that movement? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we all realize that based on this accumulating mountain of evidence that indicates challenges with both cleaning and reprocessing of GI scopes, that that's particularly concerning when with semi-critical devices that may cross the mucosal barrier. And so anything that becomes more of a therapeutic operation, if you will, and the potential to introduce pathogens into the human body, duodenoscope certainly being one of the more notorious devices in that category. You know, we've been asking for a while, how do we create a higher level of confidence, certainly a higher safety margin for those types of scopes in particular. And so knowing that at the end of the day, sterilization, of course, with the exceptionally well-proven track record and validated in a way with a very high margin of safety, if you will, you know, we've been asking together with certainly many others in, in this industry, how do we move some of these semi-critical devices to sterilization and provide that higher margin of safety? 
such that even if there could be suboptimal cleaning procedures, even if something else, whether it's a defective component of the scope, et cetera, is not caught earlier in the process. And, and by the way, we shouldn't give up on those by any means. But at the end of the day, how do we make sure the reprocessing method itself has the highest margin of safety? And so this has really pushed the interest in terminal sterilization of GI scopes. Not a trivial challenge, particularly when it comes to material compatibility of these systems. And, and this is part of the reason you haven't seen this widely spread or adopted so far. So how does ASP address this with products like the Sterad NX, the Sterad 100 NX, and then I know Nancy mentioned earlier the Aeroflex automatic endoscope reprocessor? You know, we've got more than one solution to offer in this space. We've got both the high-level disinfection product in Aeroflex, which uses OPA as a disinfectant. And for the scopes that are validated in Aeroflex, we go through a very rigorous validation procedure. So this involves testing under extreme circumstances, meaning soiled scopes, meaning active at lower than use concentrations to simulate sort of worst case scenarios and, and demonstrate that the system is still effective. But at the end of the day, it doesn't provide the same margin of safety as the terminal sterilization system. And ultimately, we would like to qualify more GI scopes. While we've qualified many compatible GI scopes with the Sterad system, as I mentioned earlier, there's the push and interest to go even further with that to long flexible GI scopes. And so as we have for, for many years now, we collaborate and work with medical device manufacturers, such as the endoscope manufacturers, to develop devices and scopes that are compatible with with the terminal sterilization process. So in some cases, that means using materials that are different than those used in scopes today that are compatible with the high-level disinfection process. But in either case, whether it's for the Aeroflex system, whether it's for the Sterad system, we hold a very high standard in terms of how we validate the reprocessing in those systems, how we simulate what I call worst-case scenarios, again, unlikely to happen in the clinical environment, but again, to ensure that there's a margin of safety there when it comes to actual use of the devices. I don't think that most people out in the industry understand just how rigorous that validation process is. And you have to go through that validation process to be able to get your 510k approval on devices. And so that process is rigorous, but also it's made more rigorous by what you just described as planning or testing for worst case scenarios. And so then when you say that you're doing that for all these different devices and flexible end scopes is what we're here to talk about now. How involved is that process? How long does that take? Because that seems like a good deal of effort and work that goes into product development. Yeah, Justin, I would say that for the overall development effort for a system like the Aeroflex endoscope reprocessor, probably 30 to 40 percent of that effort is spent in actual validation of the system and, and devices. And certainly through many discussions with FDA and other stakeholders, making sure that we're aligned on what that testing should look like. So it is extensive. It involves dozens of people over months and years of time. It involves very specific protocols on how to create the simulated dirt scope. And again, some of these other things that whether it's using a lower temperature than it's expected, using a lower biocide concentration than is expected to be possible in the clinic and kind of stacking up all those worst case scenarios, can we still show that there's effective disinfection of this scope? And by the way, this is using hard to disinfect organisms like mycobacterium, like a geobacillus or other spores as the target organism, again, to kind of create these worst case scenarios. So I feel confident when we launch a product that we We've put it through some highly rigorous or very rigorous testing. And the reason we're all here, of course, is to make sure that the patient that's being treated is not taking an additional risk from the reprocessing system itself. All right, Jeremy. So I know we're getting close to the end of the interview, but we highlighted a little bit about the Aeroflex automatic endoscope reprocessor. And I know, again, that so many of our listeners are familiar with the Sterad, but what makes the Aeroflex so unique in the marketplace? Yeah, so one of the key points of failure, and I think Nancy alluded to this earlier with some of the human factors, is we know that using test strips to measure biocide concentration in 
automated endoscope reprocess, there's a, is a step that can be skipped and, and unfortunately too easy to be skipped when one is under pressure. And secondly, the results can be difficult to interpret. So visual or color-based testing strips are not certainly the most accurate way to measure biocide concentration, but yet biocide concentration, of course, is directly correlated with the efficacy of the process. And so in launching the Aeroflex system, we developed an automated MRC monitor, minimum required concentration monitor, to confirm that before the cycle starts that the active concentration is at or above the required concentration. And if it's below, the system will not start. It will not proceed with the cycle. So it literally makes it impossible to see a concentration that's below the requirement, and it automatically documents that. So if there's ever a question in the future about whether the scope was properly treated, it's easy to go back and confirm that for those cycles that the appropriate biocide concentration was met. So this is pretty unique in the market. It essentially automates one of the potential failure points in the system and provides a much higher level of confidence for the user. Excellent. And so we talked a lot about Corey Ofsted's study in the article that highlighted her findings. And so, Nancy, can you talk a little bit about that article and how the listeners can get their hands on that information? Yes, Justin. So the article is an amazing article because it's a study. And so individuals of Corey Ofsted's staff worked with hospitals and staff members in watching how they process their scopes for high-level disinfection, which is always difficult because I've been involved in a few of those myself. And when people are watching others do their tasks, they become very nervous. And if you look at SGNA's recommendations for just manually cleaning and high level disinfecting an endoscope. It's just many, many, many steps. And so it's really easy for operators to miss those steps. So she has the evidence in the study that shows where the most common steps are missed. And that highlights the challenges with reprocessing these scopes. So if individuals would go back to that article and look what she has found and evidence proves that these challenges are there, then hopefully with education, they will be able to shore up their practices and provide a better practice for processing these scopes, which of course has a direct result to our patients. All right, Nancy. Well, we always love pointing people in the direction of free resources, information, and education. So I do want to tell everyone listening today that you can go to ASP.com and you can get a copy of this article by checking out the blog article on ASP.com entitled Endoscope Reprocessing in the Age of COVID-19. Now, Jeremy, you talked a lot about the validation process, and I'm always amazed at how much work goes into that, but now you're talking about the Aeroflex and compatibility is a, a big topic. And so how can customers or prospective customers figure out if the scopes that are in their inventory are compatible with the Aeroflex? Yeah, so we'd love for customers to share with us the scopes in their inventory that they'd like to assess for compatibility with the Aeroflex system and match that up with the list that my team generates in terms of the ongoing scope validations that we're generating. So they can do that in a number of ways. They can connect with their clinical education consultant, their account manager at ASP, or certainly they can contact us through our website as well through the Aeroflex webpage, and we'll be happy to provide that feedback. All right, excellent. So uh, you mentioned the website. I'll point everybody once again to ASP.com. You can definitely find that blog article there, but also links to all the social media accounts are also available on the website. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Justin. I definitely appreciate the chance to be here with you and the team and would love a chance to come back and talk more about these subjects that are of great interest and, and passion for those of us in the industry. Well, I'll tell you, we've had nearly 200 episodes beyond clean in the books. So we're always looking for good guests and you can expect an invite at a future season. And Nancy, you too. Nice job today. Thank you so much, Justin. And as a registered nurse, for me, it's all about the patient. And ASP's products provide the technology that is behind the scenes, but being able to have those available in our facilities today just mean a lot to me, knowing that our patients are going to be taken care of very well. And Dr. Lewis, it was not your first time on Beyond Clean, so it sounds like we're going to need to have your colleagues on so we can even it up at two apiece. But I do appreciate you coming back on. Do you have anything to add before we close out the podcast? 
No, it's great to be on. And I'm thankful for the mission that Beyond Clean provides. Definitely, we're all in this for patient safety. And we're all interested as patients, too, in being safe as we receive treatment. So we thank you for providing this great service that you and your colleagues at Beyond Clean provide. That was Nancy Fellow, Senior Clinical Education Consultant, Dr. Ryan Lewis, Senior Director of Medical Affairs and Medical Safety, and Jeremy Yarwood, VP of Research and Development with Advanced Sterilization Products, a leader in infection prevention dedicated to creating product solutions and processes to help protect patients during their most critical moments. As a reminder, you can visit ASP.com and search for the blog article, Endoscope Reprocessing in the Age of COVID-19, with a free link to download Download Corey Ofsted's article, Challenges in Achieving Effective High-Level Disinfection in Endoscope Reprocessing, referenced throughout this interview. It was great speaking with Dr. Ryan Lewis again, and I would also encourage you to listen to his bonus episode from this past April entitled, Preventing Contaminated Devices in Light of COVID-19, which is the highest downloaded educational episode on Beyond Clean in 2020. We spent a lot of time today discussing a potential paradigm shift shift from high-level disinfection to sterilization. But another thing that really stood out to me was just how extensive and involved the validation process is for bringing new equipment to the market, such as the Aeroflex AER. But that's going to do it for this week's Vendor Spotlight. As a reminder, you can help support Beyond Clean by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or by downloading our smartphone application for iPhone and Android. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show and if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode just send an email to info at beyondclean.net thank you for listening to this vendor spotlight on beyond clean 